Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Terry Peters and I'm the host of the evening and the co-chair of our DAS 2021-2022 lecture committee at the Department of Architectural Science at Ryerson University. Welcome to everyone tuning in from Toronto and elsewhere uh, to our department and to the last talk in this term's lecture series. We are uh, here this evening via Zoom because we're still uh, dealing with COVID and we're only recently reopened to in-person learning. The lecture series uh, we see as a real opportunity for our students, uh, an additional learning opportunity to have them engage with issues facing our profession uh, and the building industry. And many of these issues and disruptions became especially clear as a result of the COVID pandemic. So I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors of this lecture series, the Ontario Association of Architects and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. It's our tradition to begin our meetings with a land acknowledgement, which not only recognizes the enduring presence and resilience of, of Indigenous peoples on our land, but is also a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. Ryerson sits on the land that is now known as Toronto, which has been inhabited for millennia by many Indigenous nations and peoples. Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this, this territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It is in this spirit on, on behalf of our university that I welcome you all to Ryerson and to our department and on behalf of our faculty, I welcome you. Over to you, Will. Oh, right, sorry. Okay, I guess that's my, my signal <laughs> to start. Uh, okay, so uh, we're, we're gonna get started uh, with an introduction from one of our students, but before that, I, I wanted to go through a few logistical things, just super quick. Uh, so I'm Will Galloway, by the way, uh, Assistant Professor at the Department of Architectural Science and, and Co-Chair along with Terry um, for the lecture committee this year. Uh, so as, as I, I suppose most of you know, tonight's lecture is by uh, Thomas Balaban and, and Jennifer Thorogood. And the title of their talk is All Architecture is Fiction. Um, so before we introduce the, the speakers, um, I just wanted to run down a, a brief outline uh, we're going to have a lecture of about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, and after that we'll have questions. So the, the question and answer period will come at the end. Uh, however, we invite you to type in your questions, uh, not using the chat function in Zoom, but using the Q&A function. So if you have any brilliant questions while you're hearing their talk, feel free to, to type them in and we'll get to them at the end uh, after the lecture. Um, right. So. I think that's that's the main stuff that we need to talk about. So I'll invite our, our student, uh, Soma Khan, uh, to introduce uh, this evening's speakers. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's lecture series presentation. Um, on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff at the Department of Architectural Science, it is my pleasure to introduce um, this event evening speaker. We have speakers from TBA Architect, which is a Montreal-based architecture and design practice. Um, and they're known for their approach to design that addresses the development of Montreal's diverse population and how they want to live today and hope to live together tomorrow. So TBA's design has been recognized to numerous awards and publications. Like most recently, they were selected in collaboration with David Theodore through a national jury competition. Um, and they represented Can they were officially Canada's representation. Um, and their project was about imposter cities, which talks about Canadians' architectural identity and faking it. So our first speaker, Thomas Balaban, OAQ, received his professional architecture degree from McGill University. And he's worked closely with Frank Gehry Associates slash Frank Gehry Partners in LA and also Saucier Plus Bureau in Montreal. In 2012, he was appointed associate professor at um, University de Montreal. And um, he is originally from Bucharest. And our second speaker tonight is Jennifer Thorogood, OAA. She received her professional MARC degree from McGill University. And prior to her education in architecture, she uh, studied fine arts at uh, University of Western Ontario in London. 
She is a partner and principal at TBA and currently her practice is focused on like three avenues of research and production. One is architectural work, second is installations, and then the third one is material research. Um, she currently teaches design studio at McGill University. So with me, like let's all welcome and thank you Thomas and Jennifer for joining us today. It's an honor to welcome you to the DAS community. Thank you so much and thank you everyone. Um, it's actually good to be here. We would have liked to have been there in person, but uh, considering what's going on, it's probably uh, probably a good idea to keep things uh, keep things virtual for a little while. Um, I don't know if you have something to say. No, I just want to thank you very much for the invitation. It's always always a pleasure to be able to speak to students, although we can't see them face to face. <laughs> as Tom mentioned, it's it's nice to uh, nice to be here. Yeah. It's uh, it's always a little bit weird not seeing people when you are uh, when you are presenting. So I'm going to get right into the heart of things and share uh, the screen. Ask that question that should be on everybody's T-shirt. Can you see the screen? I guess the answer is nobody saying anything. We can. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, <laughs> All right, so um, I won't go too much uh, into uh, explaining the theme. I think it'll become very apparent uh, as we move through uh, the four projects that uh, we're going to show today that come from uh, maybe the last six, seven years. Yes, yeah. Um, and a wide uh, variety of, of scales of, I guess, the Biennale uh, project, which will be the last project that we'll show. Uh, kind of covers both the very small exhibition and the very large city uh, city scale all in one. Um, that is kind of where we operate. We work in mostly in urban environments. Um, so for us, the idea of this uh, tapestry, for lack of a better word, uh, of kind of layered uh, meaning uh, in in uh, in architecture, whether it's cultural, uh, historical, uh, physical. A vernacular, all of these things kind of weave themselves together into, into the work one way or another. I mean, we like to say that we work in architecture and not just buildings. Um, so there is, there is a layer to, uh, uh, to working that way that we try and bring into every project a kind of construct that comes from somewhere that brings some kind of uh, meaning into, in, into the work. I mean, buildings are real. Uh, but uh, but architecture can uh, can afford to be something else. Um, we work within budgets all the time, so as much as we can inject into our projects, we try uh, we try to do it uh, while still working within the the kind of built or uh, intending to be built uh, built world. The first project is a hotel competition that we did. Um, we were in, uh, invited uh, with four other firms uh, to imagine a hotel in a neighborhood. Uh, that is essentially made up of missing metal uh, uh, housing and commercial spaces. Uh, so very uh, mixed use on a relatively busy uh, commercial street uh, in the heart of uh, one of the most uh, popular areas uh, in, in Montreal. Um, the site of the building itself, or the site where uh, an existing building uh, was sitting that was left um, for many, many years uh, to slowly just cave in on itself because it wasn't um, um, wasn't financially uh, well, it wasn't in the interest of the developer to renovate uh, the building itself. It was at its origins um, the socialist center for the Jewish community, uh, and actually was the site of some interventions by the government during the famous padlock uh, padlock laws of the uh, of the late thirties. Uh, in early 40s, uh, the Duplessis era. So it does, the building itself had kind of an interesting history to it. You can see in the top left, uh, the project that developers had in mind for the lot before uh, the building collapsed um, and the hotel uh, owners bought the property and proposed a, a project. So that's the site of the site, but the site of the building is, uh, I guess, the neighborhood in general. So this is what um, the architecture of uh, Laurier uh, street looks like. Uh, as I said, missing metal, uh, walk-ups, uh, exterior stairs that are very characteristic of Montreal, although on the street here they're less death-defyingly spiral. <laughs> um, and again, a very strong commercial base to these buildings and this kind of 
in, in and out of the facade um, that, that is very characteristic of, uh, of the area balconies also. So uh, we're really looking at how we can look at the, the history of this area, but more on a, on a morphological level. Uh, it came out of a lot of discussions with the planning uh, advisory committees here at the city. Almost every project has to go through uh, one of these committees. And a lot of the time, uh, you're spoken to in, in very, very general terms. The plateau is red brick, or the southwest is red brick. Uh, everything is something that is some kind of a generic uh, expression of a, of a material uh, morphology. So we thought it'd be interesting to kind of play on that and take a look at this morphology and see how we can, con in a contemporary way, reimagine uh, reimagine it. And we were looking at the work of Jason Salavon at the time, a photographer who uh, superimposes and averages out photographs uh, of uh, graduations, of uh, Santas, of houses for sale, looking for this kind of uncanny essence to uh, uh, tropes and repetitive uh, shapes, colors, um, in faces and kind of urban structures. So we, we grabbed this technique and we, we took a series of photographs of all the facades at scale and kind of averaged them together into, uh, into a kind of tapestry or image of, of what the average uh, facade on Laurier looked like. And then we tried to see how we could do the same thing, but in three dimensions. So I went ahead and scanned uh, photogrammetry a whole series of buildings um, uh, on, on various streets and then for this project used uh, the ones on, on Laurier. So looking at this kind of facade as a skin uh, in the same kind of superficial way that, uh, that the city would often talk to us about, uh, about the, the facades of the street. So uh, again, a few scans and then picking up on his technique, um, Jason's technique who uh, uh, averaged each pixel out with the RGB uh, uh, values, uh, we decided to do the same thing with the XYZ coordinates of the, of the surface of the facade. So we would take the, the topography of the facade, break it down into a series of points, XYZ, and then average it out uh, across many different, many different uh, uh, facades to come up with a kind of average uh, facade for, for, for our project. I mean, the program was pretty tight. Uh, for a hotel in a very small lot, very few uh, rooms. Um, sorry, they wanted a lot of rooms, very, very little space for the, for the 40 rooms. Um, so it was kind of this idea of marrying the ins and the outs. And here's an example of one of these average facades of uh, Saint-Denis Street uh, between uh, Roy and, uh, and Duluth. Uh, kind of again, looking at the essence of what uh, these, these building skins would be like uh, old Montreal, some examples that we tested out as well of some uh, stone, uh, stone buildings in Montreal and, and playing around with the idea of this kind of uncanniness dial on, uh, on the project, like uh, how, how average is the average, how weighed is the average uh, that we did uh, through, through Grasshopper and Rhino. So this idea of kind of uh, diluting or um, quieting uh, or averaging out the the, the variance, the differences between the different, uh, the different elements on a facade. In this case, this is a single average that's been adjusted. And this is the, the average that we came up with for the, for the project in the end, for the, the two facades on Lurie and uh, Esplanade. Again, very dialed down. Uh, we do work with clients and they are not always uh, open to uh, complex constructions and risk. And, so we had to dial it down quite a bit. We didn't win the competition, so obviously we didn't dial it down enough. Uh, <laughs> but that was the, the, the kind of work that, that, that came out of that process and then looking at how we could then uh, integrate into a very, very tight, um, maxed out uh, uh, hotel on, on the lot. This idea of that block uh, and kind of open ground floor. See here that in, in section. Again, the building above uh, with uh, the restaurant and some public spaces on the roof, and then the very uh, soft uh, ground floor that, that's opened up and kind of carved out for this gallery space and the entrance to the, uh, to the hotel and kind of um, 
typical plan of the hotel room floor. You can see it's quite quite packed. And then uh, the, the ground floor with that hole in section five for the gallery uh, that, that spans across two levels. And the entrance that was actually pushed back, uh, the restaurant was a priority. Uh, so, um, and the final facade um, on Laurier Street with that kind of very open ground floor in the continuity of the rest of the street. And, uh, and the, uh, the hotel above in brick, obviously, because Montreal, the plateau is brick. Um, so again, it would have been quite, quite, quite fun to, uh, uh, to end up trying to build that, but we didn't win the competition, so moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, our next project is a built project, but it's in the urban environment, as, as Tom just mentioned for the hotel. Um, this is a tree poking instead of tree hugging, I guess. I always just found this image kind of funny. Uh, this is called Denormanville, and it's named after the street in which it resides. And for small offices such as ourselves, uh, residential is a big part of our commissioned work. But luckily, it's also very exciting work. And I think right now in contemporary architecture, housing kind of offers the most exciting challenges of, of, uh, in the field. And I see a lot of innovation coming from residential architecture itself. Um, in our office, we deal with a lot of transformation projects. And we do prefer working within existing conditions. And this means not only structure, but climate and nature and surrounding context. You know, we find it's much more interesting than starting with a blank slate, but there's also economical and environmental advantages associated with it. So to Normanville, this is the existing structure that we are transforming. It started off as a back lot shoebox house. And a shoebox house is a single story house that was uh, considered as a, a starter home and was built at the beginning of the 20th century. And the intention was that once you had the money, you could build upon it. Um, but as the city expanded, these houses got swallowed up and they were, of course, demolished to build bigger and to build more dense. So in the recent years, this single family typology has been put under kind of controversial protection regulations and it's kind of stuck between uh, preservation and identification. For us, as much as this black lot house uh, has been part of the street scape for decades. So have the mature elm trees and the front yard. So for us, the starting point for this project was the preservation of these trees and keeping that kind of front, front yard feel to the project. Uh, this is a quick elevation of, of the final project, an image of the final project where you can see we've built the house around these three existing trees. So our intervention proposed to extend the house through the front yard and weaving the spaces around the existing trees. Um, our first intervention didn't make the cut, apparently, unfortunately, but we wanted to keep the veranda and kind of have it part of the, of the new structure. The house is planned so the more boisterous and social spaces occupy what was once the front yard, while the more quiet and uh, private spaces remain in the existing house. And then the connection between the two, the, the two are separated by courtyard and we have a connection of a service corridor that connects the old to the new. But we also have a courtyard that allows a summer, uh, movement as well. So you kind of have a winter movement inside and a summer movement up on the outside. So you kind of feel like a house doesn't really stop at walls and windows and it continues out into the exterior as well. Structurally, you can see on the left, the existing house is, is uh, anchored to the ground with a crawl space. And to the right, our intervention is sitting on a concrete slab on piles. And we did this so we don't damage the root system and we stay above that, that root line of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> no woman is an island. <laughs> no woman is an island. This is uh, just me and the tree surrounded by <laughs> this, a sea of cables, but it, it was really the only spot <laughs> that we could stand and, and look over all the plans as the house was being built. 
this is a couple of shots of, of uh, the construction and you can see how the, the spaces are interwined and kind of snaked together. Yeah, there's kind of an odd symmetry between some of these some of these volumes. Yeah. So in the finished project on the interior here, you can see this is a kitchen and dining room area, and it's it's located between these two carved out spaces. To the left, you have the front of the house, and to the right, you have the court, the courtyard that goes towards the existing house. And looking back to the existing house, the full glazing of the courtyard allows these kind of these clear views to the existing house and to the existing uh, facade, uh, minus the veranda, of course. But um, so you, you kind of have within your own house this layering of history. You have where you started and where you are now. Looking towards the street, we have these two volumes that delineate the space. So on your left, we have the kind of cubic space of the entrance closet. And on your right, you're getting the carved out wall of the tree in front of it. Um, on the left, you see this is the entrance closet. And we have a translucent, semi-translucent closet. So it still allows views from the, there's a huge glazing in front from the street. So you have kind of filtered views going to the back of the house, but also has some privacy blocking the dining room. And on the right, we're back way back into the, the existing house. And it's, you know, the interior of all the house is treated as a very kind of warm woods and, and cool concrete and all kept white. And here we have a kind of a barrel view looking from the very back of the house through right through the very front of the house and seeing that that tree that kind of made us want to keep yeah. well the back half of the, the back half of the house too is a, an extension to the original yeah that's the true original yeah. house the uh, the house itself at the beginning was barely 500 square uh, square feet so here here are some images of the front of the house we we uh, clad the front elevation of the exterior with a pale mottled brick, kind of keeping the brick that was of the existing structure, but making it a more contemporary brick. So we lightened it up a bit and kind of brought in those kind of pink beige tones that, that uh, we see a lot in, in the construction now. So we can see through both these images that looking from the street into the house, you can then continue seeing the house behind. So the the, the, the extension in the front kind of acts as a social space that is somewhere between outside and inside. As, as uh, the clients who live here always say that people stop in front of the window and wave to them. But it's something that they thought they would worry about now they very much enjoy being part of the neighborhood on display. <laughs> uh, continue with the housing. Uh, topology. This is a house that has not yet been built, but it is located, the, the eventual location of it is on Helby Island, which is located just off of uh, Berkeley Sound uh, and off of Victoria. So Helby is a small off-the-grid house. Um, it's on the remote island that's can only be that can only be accessed through uh, a boat. And so for this project, we really wanted to explore the kind of ephemeral nature of the island itself and of the use of the house itself. So we view this project as a hybrid of a, a tent and a twent, a tent and a dwelling. Uh, and it was kind of conceived as a kit of parts and something that could be built by the the clients themselves and that could be transported by boat to the island without much external help. So here's an image of, of all of the uh, kind of pieces we laid out in that old uh, 60s Volkswagen car disassembly, disassembly diagram. diagram aesthetic. Um, the house is planned around a wet room and the wet room is a space that allows you to transition from the, the rugged exterior into a calm interior. So you, you come into this space unclean and you enter clean. So we see like 
like iron living is about salt water, it's about rocks, it's about kayaking, it's about fishing, it's about the beach. So it's generally a messy activity. So we just wanted this house to kind of act as a space that, that you know, you're living outside just as much as you're living inside. So you have this transition of coming, coming in dirty and cleaning yourself and relaxing within the, the protected space itself. Uh, this house is planned with a shower outdoor sink area, an indoor sink area back to back with a shower and, and bathroom block connected. And then you walk into the main living space and sleeping is divided on either side of, of the home itself. The uh, green aspects of the house, we wanted to keep the house completely off grid and have all the anemones available on site. So we have water collection and primary water storage located above the wet room and the water is distributed to these areas through gravity. And then we've used very uh, common passive passive house interventions such as the uh, overhang to control solar gain and uh, stacked ventilation or a solar chimney, as well as uh, solar panels and gray water filtration system. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think the, the important part of this project was also this idea of that the lightness of, uh, of, the, of the structure. So we were looking more at a kind of a, a, a tent uh, frame with uh, a series of membranes and elements that uh, that would wrap it instead of more of a traditional uh, wood uh, plywood sheet um, construction. So something that could be rolled up uh, and sent over. Um, obviously, there's a slab uh, associated with uh, with where this this tent like structure sat. Um, but the idea was that it would be this kind of light aluminum structure that would come in and it would be this unfolded uh, series of, of panels or membrane mesh, uh, not mesh, uh, sorry, I mean uh, uh, Vienna <laughs> yeah, mode here. Of... We used a very similar uh, mm -hmm. technique on the Vienna. But um, so this kind of uh, waterproofing membrane that would then wrap uh, the whole house and, and be sealed. Um, again, uh, the, the tent-like structure itself required a series of nodes to come in connect the, the kind of complicated uh, geometry together and to offset uh, the membrane that would then uh, wrap, wrap the project. And uh, one of our uh, 3D printed um, nodes trying to test out the scale and uh, the, uh, the geometry of some of these uh, more custom connections. So these would be all made uh, in advance uh, and uh, assembled on site. With uh, with the post, so the tolerance for the project would be taken within within the post and not and not within the nodes. And exterior would be this uh, PVC and nylon membrane that would then be attached to each of those offsets on the nodes and on the inside, uh, clad with a series of uh, wooden uh, strips that would then follow the uh, geometry uh, on the inside. So creating this kind of um, feeling of, 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 of fa a fabric or some kind of texture on the inside that was not drywall, heavy drywall sheets that would then be, uh, uh, would need to be brought, uh, brought to the site. Uh, and again, you can see through to the outside where that tent, a tent wrap would uh, complete the, uh, the waterproofing of, uh, of the structure. Uh, obviously things such as windows would be brought in um, already pre-assembled. Uh, pre Kind of likened it to a layered puffy coat. Yes, yeah, North Face House. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then uh, the uh, the Biennial project, which is probably I think the first competition that we've won in ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 in a while. <laughs> in, in a long time, uh, we're not we're not good at winning competitions. Um, but we did with this one, and uh, I'm very happy to have done it. Um, and uh, it, it, it again spoke to um, a lot of the kind of concerns that we have about trying to understand our identity and the identity of our, our buildings and how it manifests. And uh, we did this project with uh, David Theodore, who we've known for uh, 
uh, for a long time, uh, who um, curated a, a large part of the project, but it was a big team, as, as you'll see, and, and a lot of the work kind of evolved. It was an original, it was original research when we uh, proposed the project. Um, we, uh, we had some very strong ideas, but uh, very little of the research done. Um, so we kind of started to dig and see where this project would take us. At the heart of it, it looked into kind of trying to understand how we as architects see our buildings. Uh, Bannister Fletcher's uh, you know, tree of architecture on the left that still uh, provides the foundation to a lot of our ideas about architecture being somehow born from geography, uh, political climate, and all kinds of other fact cultural factors as well. Um, and on the right, kind of this idea of the contemporary malleability to image, uh, to uh, identity, to everything that uh, the media is able uh, to play around with and, and, and kind of uh, send back to us in a newly configured uh, uh, way with different meanings. And, and so somewhere between all of this, we're trying to figure out where our uh, kind of architecture is positioned today and, and we, uh, our identity, the identity of our cities, uh, how that all falls within that spectrum of, of, uh, of positions, architecturally speaking. Um, you know, cinema is very uh, adept at remaking. Um, they're not very good at making from scratch, uh, which is very interesting. It always takes some kind of foundation onto which to build and play around with. So uh, some uh, images from uh, one of our collaborators on the project, Mr. X, uh, who specializes in uh, digital effects uh, for film, in particular, uh, reconfiguring urban spaces. Uh, and you can see how some of these spaces get collaged very quickly. Sorry, the video takes a while. Um, here at Dundas Street, uh, Lakeview Diner, I believe is right on the a few restaurant, I believe, is right on the right, and uh, this kind of uh, mishmash of, of elements that that speak to uh, creating the city as a character in, in the film. And it, it's surprising to to see how many uh, films that we would consider authentic representations of of, of place uh, are actually uh, hybridized and and reconstructed. Uh, I have in order. To appear authentic, um, you know, more authentic than than the real uh, cities that that we inhabit, and uh, urban planning and uh, and cities have have long kind of, especially Canadian cities, it's been a long time that they've caught on to this this idea of the necessity for uh, the foundations of these of these cinematic worlds and these cinematic spaces, uh, both contemporary and period pieces. So here, uh, city of Montreal a series of uh, packages for filmmakers uh, to try and understand what parts of our city can fit uh, into uh, different types of personalities or play which types of characters uh, in film. Um, we interviewed a lot of filmmakers when we were making uh, cities and this idea of the city as a personality, as a character uh, came, up, uh, came up quite often. Uh, as often as uh, people talk to me about what a patchwork uh, a lot of our cities, Canadian cities are, uh, due to uh, a lot of uh, late development, uh, we missed a lot of the uh, huge uh, demolition and reconstruction that happened in the 70s. So, so Canada has been both fortunate and unfortunate um, over the course of history. Uh, and ended up with a very uh, broad range of, of, of buildings, uh, uh, quite rich, um, uh, but also quite based on many other cities uh, and many other uh, buildings. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about kind of colonialism and uh, how many of our buildings, especially in Montreal, are uh, uh, copies of, of buildings in, in Europe. So again, that, that was part of the the discussion and the debate. And the more we, we worked on the project, the more we realized we needed to bring other people into it. So it kind of grew into this, for, for a small project, it grew into kind of a very enormous, enormous team uh, on the left, uh, uh, curators, uh, graphic designers, uh, digital artists, uh, film editors, sound editors, 
um, and then all of the research uh, team that, that went into it as well. On the right, all of the filmmakers that we spoke to, that we interviewed, that kind of provided the foundation for uh, the richness of our, of our discussions and debates. So we kind of tried to balance it as much as we could between the cinematic uh, view and the architectural view um, uh, when, we, when we put the project together. Strangely enough, um, one of the, why well, I shouldn't say strangely, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> one of the characters that, 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 that took front and center, uh, one, of the, one of the, I guess, team members of, of the project was actually the Canada Pavilion, uh, this very bizarre building that was built, uh, designed uh, by uh, VVPR, an Italian architect with uh, reparations funds after the war for Canada uh, in the image of what a Canadian uh, pavilion would be. Uh, you don't see what's surrounded. Surrounding the Canadian pavilion are uh, three enormous neoclassical buildings, Germany, uh, uh, France, and uh, England. And so often the joke with this building by a lot of uh, people who've had to work in it is that it is like the Canada Parks restroom for, for, the, for the larger buildings uh, around it. But I mean, we, we, we kind of fell in love with it and uh, took its um, both symbolism and uh, actual physical presence as a, as a, as a starting point. We, we scanned the building and we started to look at how it could play an important role uh, in, in our exhibition, uh, especially since it is uh, it was done by an Italian architect. It is representing Canada in a way, and it's been there for many, many, uh, many years. So uh, it, it became a real kind of uh, uh, point of departure for a lot of uh, the work that we did. And uh, here, uh, one of the first models for uh, the the kind of screening room uh, in the center, at the heart of the pavilion, um, which was designed uh, at McGill uh, by David uh, David Theodore and. Uh, uh, Cameron, Hervé, and uh, Joel big, as well. Big team. Yeah, <laughs> a, a big team. So it was funny because where we had started with a curator, uh, you know, research team, architects, exhibition designers, uh, everybody kind of mixed mixed in together. And I think the richness of the project came from the fact that um, uh, we all collaborated on this, and those boundaries really blurred between uh, between everybody. So curators and uh, professors here designing spaces, uh, us pitching in with the curation. So it kind of filmmakers coming in. It really became this kind of uh, rich uh, network of people trying to, to to figure all of this out because it hadn't, hadn't been done before. Um, so it's kind of spatializing of, of film here um, in the, in the space. And then one of the one of the images from the point cloud scan of of the pavilion, which has this kind of beautiful uh, drawing like. Uh, kind of uh, poetic vibe to it, but it is actually a very digital, very very digital <laughs> image, uh, straight from the screen of of the point uh, of the point cloud. Okay, so the the exhibition itself, we had planned it in what we dubbed as three speeds. So this was kind of based on three different kind of time commitments and I guess interest that a visitor would have. So the first speed we call the flyby and this is to do with the exterior of the pavilion itself. So the exterior pavilion we wrapped in a green screen that is you know normally used in film for chroma, chroma clean and this this mode of, of viewing is signifies to the to the visitor that you know, our exhibition of Plaster Cities is about film, but it also engages the, the viewer into the idea itself and into the building itself, because the wrap not only serves to make the building invisible, but it also highlights the unusual form of this building, the uh, Canadian Parks and Recreations bathroom. <laughs> the, rest, the restroom pavilion. <laughs> the restroom pavilion. The uh, lobby, acts as kind of a transition zone. So this serves to get the visitor into movie mode and ready to go into the screening room. Uh, the exterior chroma key of the pavilion comes into the lobby and we have a chroma key effect in the lobby 
that allows a visitor to view themselves, a digital version of themselves, and then they follow themselves into the screening room. The screening room is the heart of the project and it's for the visitor who has like 15 to 20 minutes of the exhibition. And I mean, I, I'm kind of explaining this very, you know, matter of factly, but, but being out of BNL and with hundreds of exhibitions to see, you, you really have to think about all these different uh, ways to view your project. So for us, this became very important to have our project to be accessible at many different speeds. So the screening room is comprised of a four channel projection that simultaneously plays loop su supercuts that we've called up from over 3000 film clips. And with this uh, supercuts, we also have a sound installation that uh, that was put together by a team member and of Jordan, who I'll talk about a bit later. Yeah, a surround sound installation. A surround sound installation, yes. <laughs> and then the final third speed is the library. And the library is for the, the uh, visitor who wants to browse at their own pace. And it contains information about the buildings themselves, as well as a series of interviews that we did with Canadian filmmakers, directors, set designers, and industry ins insiders in general. Um, so this is a section through the screening room. Uh, we thought a lot about, and as Thomas previously shown with some of the models, we thought a lot about how a body fits in this space, how the body interacts with film as a fleeting image and film as screens as a physical thing. So the screening room has uh, these three meter height high screens that follows the kind of accordion shape of the building and, and it creates these kind of folded moments where you get a layering of, of the images. Uh, this photo is just funny because we can't, every time we, we talked about the screening room and our supercuts, we couldn't help but always use gestures to kind of ex explain how the body takes up the space and we were constantly gesturing like, this is how you fit in, this is how you fit in the space. And, and it became a really interesting experience because you are no, you realize you're no longer watching a film, sitting in a seat and watching something that is 90 degrees in front of you. You're, you're participating in a space where the film becomes a, an object itself. So the final layout of the interior saw eight projections projectors that were displayed on five screens and they were kind of arranged in three different chambers. So on the, the top of the, uh, the images on the top of the uh, image, sorry, the screens on the top of the image are in that accordion shape that follows the, the, the glazing of the Canadian pavilion around the courtyard. And here, depending on where you, we, we call this the uh, mad magazine effect. You kind of get a folding of, of images and a folding of, of the screens. And so depending on where you're standing, you're getting a view of two to three screens and you, you get even a view of one screen that kind of folds in on itself. So it's, it's quite a dynamic space and there's quite a bit happening in this space. And, and then at the top of the screen, you see the lobby. Here we had a uh, effect where as you walked in the lobby, you were recorded and then your recording was projected on a composite image of a building that we we took some recordings of and we added in bits from films from films and we added in some kind of elements that kind of grounded the building to its site so such as snow or rain or lightning something like that yeah. uh, so when the visitor walks through this lobby to the right of them they're walking beside themselves and so so this is what david always termed movie mode, it, it, it uh, prepares them for what they're about to see. Uh, we did a lot of tests, which I mean, was it was great fun, a lot of work, but great fun to do. This is uh, Joel here testing different, uh, different finishes on how to show the projection the way we wanted and different uh, angles and uh, different uh, sizes, so. Yeah, there was always this idea of always the relationship between the body and the screen yeah. and the screen between the body and the building between you know the building and the screen so the idea of the the cities that we represented the buildings that we represented well it happened at different scales uh in proportion to the screen in proportion to the body so there was always this idea of trying to calibrate and recalibrate and choreograph 
um, this this recomposition that was happening uh, at the different scales and always at the end uh, the relationship to the to the human body the viewer but also the viewer inserted into uh, in the lobby into the into the environment so again trying to blur the boundary between what was real and what was uh, being seen, but at the same time, making everybody very aware that there was a physical geometry and there was a screen and there was a pavilion into which all of this was, well, where all of this was playing out. And this is a, we, we tried to, this is the first time we tried the green screen effect. And it was for our, I believe our kind of mid project presentation and everybody just fell in love with it. So we knew it was a keeper. <laughs> Yeah, I think that then the, the, the real work began, <laughs> which is, okay, you have all of these films, all of these Canadian cities, how, how do you put all of this together? And so um, research team went to work and uh, everybody, all hands on deck, uh, Nick uh, put together a long list of films. Uh, everybody started to call through and uh, slowly come up with a series of uh, important buildings that that reappeared or juxtapositions, comparisons. I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. And, and trying to choreograph how all of these came together. And of course, we're not film editors. So in comes John Gerdebeek, uh, uh, who helped us put together uh, this uh, beautiful choreography of the four screens. Uh, first, uh, flat and trying to kind of come up with what the relationships are, what we're trying to say about the different spaces here, the uh, famous Lakeview restaurant in Toronto across you know, 20 years of, um, no, sorry, more than 20 years uh, of films. Um, you know, this kind of stereotypical guy walks into a bar uh, kind of scenario. And uh, again, the same space playing out, uh, you know, a series of archetypes and, uh, and trying to kind of understand the space through that. Uh, and then again, spatializing all those relationships into the pavilion and adjusting. Um, and Joel did this through, uh, through Unity. So we simulated uh, the space uh, in Unity, trying to understand um, how all of those screens uh, end up uh, manifesting and what Jen calls the Mad Magazine effect of those, of those spatial juxtaposition. Again, uh, a very important uh, study in scale, people uh, against uh, architecture in space, against people in space, in real space, in the pavilion, uh, the pavilion against the screens and, uh, and all that kind of trying to come together into a into meaningful, uh, meaningful way. So we had all of this film magic we had all of these uh, great actors, these buildings, these cities uh, playing together into uh, this kind of composite uh, uh, experience. And it was very much about that, that experience. Um, the last element that needed to come together in all of this were the real, the real spaces as, as they exist in the cities. And again, uh, for the montage that uh, Alison Moore uh, a digital artist helped us with at uh, the lobby and on the outside of the building. We needed the real material of the real buildings to, to work with. And uh, in comes Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> so the team, we had Cameron who went around the country shooting things and <laughs> interviewing people. Uh, we were able to go to shoot a couple of places across Canada. And as Tom mentioned, we wanted these to have for our composite images where we have real life locations and we have real life sounds that uh, we mix with the cinematic, the cinematic uh, locations and the cinematic sounds. So we see here Randolph at Simon Fraser capturing the sound of the, of the seagulls. Uh, Randolph made the uh, surround sound with the help of Florian for the project where he, he layered real sounds with like cinematic snippets to create the, uh, the soundtrack that kind of goes in and out of a, a reality that sometimes, sometimes uh, meshes up with the images, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it fades into something else, sometimes it's in your face quite strong. 
even the sound we wanted to to create a sense of space with it so that was kind of an important uh, an important thing as, as well um jumping in there that's okay <laughs> and uh, on the left david uh, hamming it up uh, in a mock-up for the lobby where we uh, purposely out um made the image and the person out of sync so there's this kind of uncanny <laughs> Yeah, you follow yourself into the uh, into the screening room in the pavilion, um, and then on the outside, uh, via uh, an application, uh, a filter in Instagram, uh, you're able to uh, record all of these Canadian uh, scenes playing out uh, on uh, on uh, on the building itself. So all of a sudden, Canadian buildings take the place of of Canada, uh, of the Canadian pavilion in Venice. So instead of Canada playing other places, Venice gets to play Canada for a little while. These were some quick mock-ups that we did to try and understand. Um, what would work, and, yeah. Yeah, what, what kind of clips fit, and there's 3,000 to go through, so it took a while. Yeah, and again, trying <laughs> to understand the scale of the building versus the scale of the film yeah. buildings versus the scale of the people in the space um, and, and how all that could possibly come together. Um, a lot of fun, a lot of work. And just to make it more kind of complete, um, Paul Karowski uh, did the kind of graphic uh, art direction for the project and the graphic design. Uh, again, looked to uh, kind of a foundation for the project within uh, kind of research into identity. And uh, his graphic design work was based on the Federal Identity Program, which uh, came about in the uh, late 60s with the Languages Act, the government trying to um, bring together uh, its graphic image, the way buildings were labeled, especially addresses, and again, trying to address both English and French identities within a single graphic uh, graphic presence. So uh, again, it seemed very appropriate to kind of pick up on that and, and develop it into a graphic image of the project. Uh, hellish, um, <laughs> because you're dealing with different uh, screen ratios, different color timing, different aesthetics. So the representation of, of our cities is already highly uh, transformed and in very different aesthetics and very different uh, structures. So trying to bring that all together became this incredibly interesting but difficult uh, process of trying to organize, come up with systems, rules for breaking the systems. Uh, and again, how do I identify buildings in, in the clips? Uh, so again, this idea of the address, the Canadian address uh, through that federal identity program became this this important tool, uh, again, to identify uh, things, uh, locations, uh, places. Um, again, very, very complex. And then this color green, David loves to why all this green. green. Why all the green? <laughs> he doesn't use that voice, that's just my, my voice for other people's voices. Um, why all this green, um, which started off with this idea of chroma keying, but became this way of kind of tying tying everything together. Yeah, it also it became a way to, as Tom says, to tie everything together, but also to kind of really highlight things. Because uh, especially in the exterior of the pavilion and what was intended in the lobby, that the green had a purpose of chroma key, but it also had a purpose to, to create this kind of unreal space where every element was green. Yeah. And trying to match all those greens. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is tr tr trickier than you think. Yeah. Um, and also, the, the green made the, the Canadian pavilion seem that much more strange of an animal within the whole. Yeah. Uh, the green versus the green of the trees in the in the uh, in the space again added that level of, of artifice to uh, uh, to the project. So, a lot of tests trying to get this to work. Trying to get the right team. Yeah. yeah. Um, both, you know, inside and then eventually outside, uh, trying to make this this kind of magic, this magic happen that would then juxtapose not just all these uh, cinematic spaces, but the real spaces into which they they exist outside. Uh, so let's hear a couple of images fr from the pavilion wrap. Um, you can see, especially on the right, when the sun hit it, it was this really strange green that you could see poking out throughout the trees, but it was really, really, uh, really quite nice, especially when you're on the Vaporetto coming, coming down the canal, you can see it poking throughout the trees. Uh, so 
and I mean, we went through a lot of iterations on the wrap and, and there's a lot of factors that we had to consider. Uh, I won't get into all of them with heritage, but uh, we, the wrap is completely independent of the pavilion itself. So we had to create a structure that literally sits an inch and a half away from the Canada Pavilion. And in the, you know, wanting to have everything green, the whole structure is painted green and then the green wrap is over top of it. And we worked in, uh, well, I guess I should go more into the effect of it. So this is the Instagram filter effect that went with the exterior of the Canada Pavilion. Um, so what you could do is scan a, a code at the pavilion and then it would launch you into a series of filters. So with these filters, the Canada Pavilion was erased and replaced by um, our composite images. Models or structures which could turn <laughs> things on the top right are Christopher Rock and they German got Haber, into this kind of many of them got lecture into this the kind of uh, weekend or they, August. models or structures which that, could know, turn but here's here's a couple of thing around we just selected some images from and they got shared into from our this Instagram kind of, app. Many of them got into this kind of uh, uh, which they, we were very, models or structures, uh, we're which very happy with the success of the app and managed to get around over 100,000 uh, And they got into this kind of... I mean, they're, they're going, yeah, but what David loved to, to say is like, um, uh, you know, most people uh, have never been to our buildings. They've only seen them in films and most people have seen Canadian architecture. They just don't know it. So this is kind of our way of bringing uh, Canadian architecture to more uh, kind of the forefront, bring it to them instead of having them come to it. Um, uh, yeah. So when we when we um, were going through the process of, of getting approval to to wrap the pavilion, it came to this kind of half wrap that uh, we really grew to love because we had this kind of half, I mean, fully real, but then a half real and half digital. Kind of experience on the Canadian Pavilion, and we worked a lot in, in Rhino, uh, modeling things to to the inch, as I said, because we had we had the scan of the pavilion, so that really helped us. Although the scan was not one hundred percent accurate, <laughs> believe it, but we just used a very simple system of uh, steel poles and standard scaffolding clips, and then we we had each piece individually made to fit. Each it's fit between each pole. We worked with. Uh, here's the, here's the uh, wrap, unrolled in Rhino. We just as we were working uh, towards the exhibition, we, we made a lot of kind of nice images that we that we liked, that uh, really kind of capture the uh, exhibition for me. I go back, back to that. Yeah, to the uh, um, to the wrap. I, I think we had originally planned on wrapping up the whole pavilion. I guess it's, you know, it is a heritage building. It was it was a protected building. So I think this idea of having this the second skin on the building uh, kind of ended up being important. Um, and in the end, it was it was actually good because we brought it back to Canada, and uh, recently received a, a, a grant. From Canada Council was very generous throughout the process, and um, again to uh, tour uh, the pavilion uh, and the exhibition uh, in Canada uh, in the next uh, year or two, uh, starting with uh, Montreal and uh, in Toronto. So hopefully, uh, some of that. you will get to see it <laughs> uh, installed somewhere um, uh, in uh, in Canada. Um, and then, yeah, then COVID hit. Um, <laughs> So 
we had to kind of rethink a little bit or who saw the project in the end because people can travel and, and we kind of rethought um, the content a lot of the content is our exhibition a lot of library content didactic uh, information uh, of the exhibition and tried to find a way to bring it uh, to Canada during the Biennale for everybody who uh, who couldn't be there so um, we we built this uh, this structure with uh, with David and uh, Paul uh, Karowski our um, uh, graphic designer um, that again was true to a lot of the things that we were trying to accomplish with uh, the screening room and with the pavilion and with the content uh, of the exhibition trying to kind of give this layered um, simultaneous uh, expression of opinions, of ideas, uh, techniques, uh, camera views of the inside of the pavilion uh, for people in Canada who, who couldn't be there, as well as some of the actual clips that, that played out. So um, this content uh, we'll keep adding to and, and keep feeding uh, from, uh, from the library. Uh, I think we've only gotten through a very small portion of it. And constantly kind of updating the uh, uh, the different uh, uh, pigeonholes and compartments of this kind of uh, line uh, line up uh, um, view of of, of the exhibition. Uh, again, some of the spatial aspects you'll have to experience in real life uh, when the exhibition travels, uh, but you get a good, a good idea of what the library uh, and, and the screen uh, begin to feel like. Uh, from uh, from this uh, from this website, uh, we also tried many many different things uh, throughout, uh, trying to use the digital realm uh, to, uh, to discuss some of these some of these ideas, um, and even the inauguration for the pavilion, which uh, couldn't be done in uh, in Venice, we brought uh, to everyone uh, online with Canada Council, and and created a space uh, with a series of yeah. these buildings. Um, where people could walk through. I'm gonna try to find my parents. Uh, parents are here too. People can look for their parents. Oh, uh, yeah. Here. Here's my. Um, that were kind of collaged oh, yeah. from uh, the, the kind of significant. Do you want to like, you want to just screenshot? Uh, yeah, I'm taking just my camera. So but, people could yeah. travel around and, and look for, the, for their friends uh, and and listen to some of the content of the exhibition and just uh, the space they. Again, try this idea of bringing uh, the buildings in the architecture and the exhibition to bring them to Venice. Which I guess we learned a lot and you know, made, us, made us think a lot about the idea of this national some people actually get to travel once a month and discuss some very pertinent issues about architecture. Happened to me is, I was very excited we were shooting in Toronto and we ended up having to shoot Hamilton. For Toronto, because it was cheaper to shoot in Hamilton. There's something that is so noir about that place. It's like a beaten down 1950s city and Hamilton's got it all. Plus it's cheap. Cut it off so that it doesn't uh, make all of that noise. But, <laughs> anyways, um, there's a lot more to the exhibition. Uh, we didn't talk about how we determined all of the different imposter buildings that are in the show, um, the different comparisons that we did between uh, Guillermo del Toro's Toronto versus, uh, you know, uh, Handmaid's <laughs> Tales Toronto. Again, that, that that's all part of uh, of the material, which we we didn't we didn't spend hours talking about this exhibition. So. We should probably stop. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully that gives you that gives you a good idea. I think we're uh, that's not bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess we'll we'll end there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you <laughs> stop on that image. Great. Th thank you very much for that. Um, did, did you want to say something, Terry? I, I guess I'm supposed to do this yep. part. You go ahead, Will. Okay, all right, cool. So, so uh, we'd like to open up the, the floor to questions, um, which we'll be doing, uh, I guess I and, and Julia DiGiorgio will be um, coordinating that. Um, 
if it's okay, I'll, I'll read the first one. And then as they come in, Julie, if you can uh, yeah. do the next. Cool. So uh, there's a question about the De Normanville project. Uh, and the question is, uh, was the main driver to keeping it one story um, so that the foundations can be kept slab on grade and thereby protecting the tree, tree's root systems? Absolutely, but for different reasons. Um, <laughs> the, the building is actually, um, the foundations are actually uh, engineered for two stories. But for us, it was absolutely important to um, maintain the one story presence on the street. So we weren't necessarily uh, just preserving the, the, as much as we could of the, of the shoebox of the one story house in the back, but we really wanted to keep the legibility of the one or the reading of a one story, uh, not the reading, it is a one story uh, building on the street, which is against zoning regulations. Uh, the minimum in that area is two. So there was a little loophole that we, we found with, uh, we've, we lucked out, we've had some great clients. We've been really lucky with our, with our clients. Yeah, he found, he found the loophole. Yeah, <laughs> uh, very invested in the project. Um, and and uh, we really do feel like we work with them mm -hmm. and they're invested in them. Other than it being their own houses and their own living spaces, they're generally uh, fighting along with us uh, to get them to get them built. And in this case, we really did want that one story house. And uh, he's an urban planner. Um, his, his wife uh, works in medicine, but he uh, has already a good idea of how the mechanisms of the city work. And uh, he worked through the, the zoning with us and we found that loophole <laughs> and, and wow. uh, kept the one story house. Yeah. Okay. So, so when your client's an urban planner, you know how to hack all the zoning. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, that's yeah, I guess a good lesson. I mean, don't get us wrong. We believe density is great. It's, it's just not every single lot has to be maxed out. Yeah. Um, I think that some variety in the, in the streetscape is important. We also had uh, the person we're dealing with the city was very likable, which is not always the case, and, and mm -hmm. did like the project. So when we brought the kind of new reading or the loophole, he's like, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> Yeah, we, we had a lot of allies on, yeah, on that yeah. project. Great, uh, cool, Th thank you for that. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to just type them into the Q&A and, and we'll read them. Um, if, if I may, while, while we're waiting for people to ask questions, uh, I have a question about, I suppose the, the, the after effects of the Venice Biennale that you did, because that whole project was so, an unreal in a way, and, and even more so because of COVID. Did it change how you approach architecture? I, I can see that you you're invested in materials and all these kinds of things, but I'm, I'm kind of curious if the way you think about architecture is less about permanence or, or you know, if there's something that changed simply through going through that process. Yeah, absolutely. The, the tools too that I think we, we use uh, have veered more into that, uh, the idea of the, the moving image and trying to work with that, um, uh, that is a tool in our work. I mean, the themes, uh, I think the more we work and the more we deal with a lot of the very real aspects of, of working, um, the financial world is so abstract, it's you might as well, it's the biggest fiction of, of all <laughs> um, property values and how all those things work, but you know, the reality of budgets and building is very much a, a, a part of our uh, kind of daily life. Um, so trying to find ways to, to push, push beyond that has always been part of our, part of our work. Uh, more so now, I think it's, it's becoming even more and more important to try and get that through as all of the other restrictions are becoming uh, even more real <laughs> in a way. Um, right. That, that makes a lot of sense. So um, please don't be bashful. Feel free to ask any questions. I'm oh, sorry. We threw we threw a lot at uh, we threw a lot at everybody. Um, uh, I maybe have a question. Um, I really like. I can imagine it would have been a lot of fun to sift through and find all these places um, that are shown as somewhere else that are actually uh, Canadian uh, sites. And I like this idea that 
people have people do know Canadian architecture. They just don't know that they do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process of selecting? Like, how did you narrow down? There were hundreds of clips and references. How did you even start that? Uh, we started, had a, yeah, we had a couple of guidelines. Yeah. We had like, we wanted to have a tour across Canada. So we kind of, you know, purposely chose certain areas to hit. We had like uh, different categories, like uh, blockbusters or what was the one, like the superstar buildings, the ones that appear in most of the film. So oh yeah, here, no, they're, they're, they're the imposter buildings. The imposter buildings, yep. There were, yeah, I'm going to put up the slide. I think we, <laughs> we went past it, uh, went past it a bit quickly. And you also wanted ones that were used often for comparisons and then just some beautiful shots too. You just had those shots that you wanted to be part of your exhibition. So Tom's just trying to find um, this. Yeah, I found the slide. It's uh, up on there. So right. <laughs> Yes, so we kind of identified some of the big stars that would that would appear throughout many, many. It started with lists, lists. There were just lists after lists after lists of buildings and places. And we called uh, the web, uh, uh, books, blogs, interviewed filmmakers everywhere to try and find out who these these rock stars of Canadian architecture are. Um, and obviously, top of the list many, many Oscars, uh, University of Scarborough, <laughs> the Andrews Building, yeah. uh, stockpile of Oscars under that under that project. Um, so it started with those big stars, Lakeview Restaurant, uh, R.C. Harris, water treatment plant, amazing. Uh, you know, wedding photos, there's like websites full of wedding photos at a building that is used as the most evil sinister <laughs> yeah, sane asylum. yeah buildings and in, in, yeah. in architecture uh, in films uh, and yet you know it's an architectural water treatment plant and it's a beautiful location to have your wedding picture <laughs> so that kind of stuff was obviously you know no need to talk about it anymore that's that's a star right there yeah. um stuff like sfu there was interesting like yeah. sfu is a, is a big draw but ubc is as well and there's uh you know ubc always plays a school and SFU never plays a school. So it's yeah. kind of, you know, those things are, are interesting. Yeah, I mean, you've got the undercurrent, obviously, yeah. the whole big list uh, school of architecture. So again, there's some things that popped out right away uh, that everybody across the board talked about, whether it was the filmmakers, us, the web, uh, books, uh, everybody. So those are the, the, the great ones. And then uh, other great, uh, you know, the capital G not, uh, so the, they came out, then there were the super clips, which were these kinds of very exemplary um, uh, images of cities uh, and buildings uh, that came out, uh, kind of these classic images that, that, that everybody kind of had stuck in their heads. Um, moments, explosions, there's people love to blow up Lots of modern Canadian buildings. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then uh, the comparisons uh, between different uh, views of the same city by different filmmakers also also came up a lot. So um, we used uh, actually Instagram posts to try and work through some of our ideas and, and trying to bring bring you know uh, trying to distill information down to like one quick image and some text as a way of us understanding uh, as well. So it, it just worked through many different um, media. Uh, and again, you know, architects pitched in with curators, pitched in with filmmakers. And through all of that, some kind of consensus came out. Not always, you know, it was, it was just organic. I hate that word, but it, it did come out naturally through all those, through all those conversations. Um, and that's what built the framework. After that, it was just, yeah, grinding was... work going through every clip luckily a lot of us love movies so we uh already had that behind us but had to grind through a lot a lot a lot of film i think we we all have ptsd from the experience yeah. it, was, it was and it was... we all we all think that there's a canadian building in every film yeah now that's that's <laughs> now you can't see a movie without saying, oh, that's, that's, that's canadian that's canadian well, yeah. even when it's not like, oh yeah that's canadian 
um, that's that place or that's that place. So that's kind of the reverse effect. And then it, it went into the editing process and we had someone else look at it. So then he had to kind of match things himself as well. So then some films kind of clips got brought in because they matched other clips better. Yeah, that composition of the four, the yeah. four channels added another layer. Yeah, it was, uh, it's always kind of interesting looking back on a project, trying to kind of work through how some decisions were made and, 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 and how some structures that you thought uh, were crystal clear in the end, you ended up having to break apart because they just, theoretically they make sense, but practically they don't make sense. Um, and again, you're dealing with so much material that you really can't aestheticize. I think that was one of the kind of interesting things about the project is, you know, the cinematic view is very aesthetic, but when you have so much of it together, the aesthetic consideration goes out the window and it's very much about how it all works together, if it makes sense, and not so much how it looks anymore, which is very strange because it's very upsetting when something doesn't, you know, look perfect or look good. So it's, we had to struggle with that as well. Cool. Thank, thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, Julie, just... do you want to ask the next one? Yeah, sure. So we have another question asking, what's your next project life like if you're using photogrammetry and point cloud? Um, I guess, well, you know, maybe this is, I don't know if there's anybody out there who can help us with this, <laughs> but the next, the next step uh, or so, something that we need help with is somehow either using machine learning or uh, some other aspects of artificial intelligence, try and figure out how to identify different building components within the topography mm -hmm. and then kind of sort and uh, work through a set of priorities and through a set of, of, uh, of, of decisions. So it's not just a top topographical uh, average, but it's a kind of an intelligent understanding of, of different architectural components uh, and then how that comes together. So if there's anybody out there who uh, is an expert uh, in machine learning can help us with that, uh, please give us a call. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, a big problem with, with when you scan the, those those big fields. Uh, the, the guy who was doing PhD next to me, uh, probably 10 years ago, that was his project. I'm pretty sure he graduated with the PhD, but I'm also certain he didn't figure it out. Uh, it's, so it's so a tough one, yeah. yeah. Hopefully someone else did. Uh, it's, it's super tough though, yeah. Uh, sorry, there, there's one more question here. So it's asking uh, about the project in BC and, and the status of the house. And did you have any problems with zoning? No. No, no, no. <laughs> no it hasn't gotten to that point yet. So I guess that is answers both those questions. That's the status. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's in progress, I guess, is that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's auto construction. So, you know, sometimes when you do have uh, people working on the project with you, they don't always have the same schedule. You know, we're used to like, we start a project, you finish a project and you move on. Or at least that's how we like to do it. But in reality, you know, you're working at the pace of uh, somebody's decision-making process and their priorities. And uh, it's also the, the lot is it's owned by four friends. So I think they have decisions to make amongst themselves as well. But... Right. But they're all keen to build it. I think they're very, they're very kind of, it, it was funny because when we first presented, it wasn't what they had in mind, but they were so like in love with it. It was, I mean, again, they were nice clients as well, but and I always, I always enjoy doing that when the first thing someone says is like, this is what we have in mind. But by the end of talking with them, they're, they're on board, so. Yeah, there's still a lot of R&D to do with that project, but yeah. it's, uh, hopefully one day it'll, uh, it'll materialize. Right, and then we have another question as well, uh, saying identifying, identifying features with machine learning is one thing. What would you like to do with the results? Ah, that is a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> ideally, come up with uh, a new way of uh, uh, kind of a new vernacular maybe for, for, for the Montreal condition that follows within uh, kind of a series of linear evolutions or maybe non-linear evolutions. I find that there's a, a strong pressure to maintain a certain uh, formal 
uh, structure to things, whether it's the composition of facade or windows, it, you know, and, uh, and you look at the work that's done over the past I don't know, 30, 40 years, uh, trying to come to terms with how you take that and you do something new with it. Um, there was a whole era of mimetic, uh, horrible facade work. Um, this idea now of basically keeping two meters of the facade and then doing something else behind it. And I think for us, that was uh, the great thing about the Normanville is, you know, the usual MO is you have a three-story building that's kind of growing out of a, a one-story building two meters back. Yeah. So, you know, we've tried a lot of things, none of them work. So hopefully through a more digital uh, kind of, uh, I guess, research work, uh, things could move forward and still maintain uh, a very visible tie to, uh, uh, to this lineage of, of, of evolving. Um, uh, I'll call it a vernacular, but a uh, way, of, way of designing. And in much, I mean, Montreal touches us, especially because we, we do know the, the history. We've worked on these buildings and we've seen their guts many, 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 many times, um, which is funny because the interior structure and organization of it, you see such a clear evolution. Um, but on the outside, it just feels like uh, it's being, being chained down by, by other things. Great, thanks. It's, it's a very uh, thoughtful answer, very, very interesting. Uh, a problem for us all, I, I think, going forward. Um, so there's a question here from uh, Melania asking, have you done any projects you love with not so nice clients? Uh, and <laughs> the the follow-up or connection to that is, you know, are, are good clients a pre prerequisite for good projects? No, I don't think so. That we've done projects. We don't usually work with clients we don't like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it, yeah, <laughs> so I, it, we've been lucky that way, I guess. For me, we've gone, we've had conflicts with clients sometimes, but in the end, there's kind of a common vision for it. But yes, I, you can obviously do good work with, 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 with clients that you butt heads with. Um, it's more uh, rare. Uh, I think more often than not, it does end up in strange, strange results, but uh, it is possible. Yeah. It, it depends what they butt heads, what you butt heads over, I suppose, as well. Yeah, yeah probably. And, and this is also a problem for all architects, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're also pushovers in a way. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, if someone if someone comes to us with a certain challenge that we don't necessarily agree with, we'll just find a way to do it in a way that we can agree with. It. So, um, uh, yeah, we'll usually find some some way to get something moving in a direction that we like, no matter what the uh, what the opposition is. Right. It's, it's a very uh, good diplomatic answer uh, in case any clients are listening right now. <laughs> um, can, can I ask a, a quick follow-up question about that island project? Um, I, I think you, you you called it like auto auto building. The, the clients will be building it, if yeah. I understand correctly. Uh, it, it seems like quite a complicated form. Is there a trick to making something that complicated? I, I'm thinking specifically about digital tools and things like that, that actually makes it more feasible because of those tools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when, uh, when you try and render uh, kind of forms into discrete elements, uh, coming up with uh, a series of uh, kind of categories or uh, you don't have a thousand and one each different elements. Maybe the nodes can be because they're easier to identify, but in terms of the other members, you would break it down into, you know, uh, 14, uh, 10 foot, uh, you know, 20, 12 foot. So I think that the digital process does have that advantage that it can reconfigure uh, forms and services into uh, a more clear logic or series of uh, mm -hmm. discrete families of elements, um, which would be a lot harder to do uh, without uh, digital tools. So, I mean, in our heads, obviously, there's some IKEA, also a horrible example, because those things are really hard to put together. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> 
but some kind of IKEA uh, book um, that uh, that uh, the client would follow step by step to do all of those things that would be great to publish at, at some point. We'll have to create a TBA key. Yes, I have the, uh, the TBA <laughs> key. Perfect. We have another question. With the Imposter Cities Pavilion be being a digital character, do you foresee it inhabiting the metaverse in one form or another? Ah, interesting. I mean, it 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 kind of did it for the for the inauguration, yeah. and it probably still exists uh, in in one of the metaverses, um, one of the universes that will all coexist at the same time. Um, it exists on a cloud, thousand and one hard drives. <laughs> in various forms. I mean, it's there, um, all of it together and all of it in its many pieces and many copies everywhere. So at some point, some of that is going to uh, find its way into the more uh, commercial metaverse, but it already exists in the many non-commercial ones. Um, funnily enough, uh, we did a house uh, uh, called the Holy Cross House that we found someone had built in, uh, in uh, Minecraft. Okay was available in Minecraft. Did a pretty good job. Yeah, it was pretty good. I guess that's how you know when you, you've made it. When, when, <laughs> you your hands in, when 12 year old kids are building your, <laughs> building your houses in Minecraft. Yeah, there you go. Um, cool, so we can, I suppose we have a, a little bit more time for a final question, if, if anybody. Seems like seems like we've we've tapped all, all the questions. Uh, if so, I have a few, but maybe we can. Uh, I'll send you an email, perhaps, because uh, we're getting close to the end of time. Um, Terry, I think you're going to wrap up, I, I believe. Um, yeah. So. Um... Uh, we've, yeah, we've gone through some great questions and, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Soma, would you like to, uh, thank our speakers? Sorry, oh, just yeah, like... course, yeah. Um, yeah. thank you so much for speaking today and, um, answering all our questions and adding your own comments. Um, I want to thank you guys from like the students, the faculty and staff at DAS. And, um, thank you for sharing your work. Your presentation was like a crucial reminder that we must have like, um, we must embrace like unconventional design strategies when approaching Canadian identity, whether it's on a national scale or a local scale. And I think it is like a very important moment within Canada right now that we address these characteristics of like urban and natural climates, whether it's physically or in digital spaces. So thank you so much for your insight. Mm -hmm. well, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I especially liked hearing about these unconventional tools you're using and different ways of representing. It's super, super interesting. So on behalf of the Department of Architectural Science, um, thank you for, for your talk and thanks to our audience for joining. And thanks to the Department of Architectural Science staff, including Alexandra Bersineau and Leo Reutman and the student members of our committee and for their enthusiasm in planning today's lecture. So this is the last in our series this term uh, in our Department of Architectural Science lecture series. So recordings are available via our YouTube channel and uh, we'll potentially have some in-person lectures in the next term, but we'll call it there. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Bye. you very much.